This is chapter seven of Anglo-Saxon Boy by Tony Bradman, and it is called Hail of Arrows. The road west into broken country where small farms clung to rocky hills. People ran as soon as they saw them coming, mothers grabbing their children and shutting themselves in the farmhouses. The men reaching for their weapons, they clearly kept close at hand when they were working in the fields. Magnus saw the loathing in their faces and soon realised there was no point speaking to them. Late in the afternoon, they came to a village, a poor looking place in a valley, most of the houses little more than rough huts. They rode into the centre and halted. The thin, ragged villagers stared at them, children clutching their mother's legs, their eyes wide with fear. Several of Gisley's men jumped off their horses and strode up to the huts, shoving people out of the way, kicking doors open and pushing their way inside. Where are you, Osric? Gisley shouted in Danish. Come and talk to me. An old man emerged from one of the huts and stood looking up at the warriors on their horses. The village elder, Magnus assumed. A few wisps of white hair clung to his chin and his head, and he was even skinnier than everyone else in the village. We have paid your taxes, the elder said, also in Danish, although with the accent of someone more used to speaking English. We have nothing else to give you. Oh, I doubt that, said Gisli, laughing. I'll bet you've got all sorts of treasure hidden in these filthy hovels. We'll soon find out anyway. You will do as you wish, the elder said bitterly. We can't stop you. Cheer up, Osric, said Gisli. This is a friendly visit, isn't it, my lord? He turned to Magnus and grinned. Elsewhere in the village there was a crash and somebody screamed. It doesn't sound like it to me, said Magnus, tight-lipped. Oh, that's just one of the lads having a bit of fun, said Gisli. Tell him his fun is over, said Magnus. We are finished here. They took a different route back to York, a quick one, according to Gisli. The sky was filled with dark clouds now, and the afternoon grew dim and murky, the shadows lengthening, making it feel as if night was upon them. Magnus was barely aware of his surroundings. He couldn't stop thinking of the terrified villagers and how he had hated seeing Gisli and his men treating them that way. Hakon rode up close behind, beside him, breaking into his thoughts. Keep your shield high, Magnus. I don't like the look of this place. Magnus glanced around. They were riding through a narrow forested valley, steep slopes on both sides. Gisli and his men were in front, strung out loosely along the track, the house cars riding in pairs behind them. As he looked, Magnus caught a glimpse of shapes moving swiftly between the trees. Suddenly he heard a thrumming sound and an arrow thwacked into the throat of the bought man just ahead of him. The man toppled off his horse, blood spurting from the wound. Ambush! Hakon yelled. An arrow thwacked into Gisli's men and some of their horses. Magnus felt one fly past his face, the feathers brushing his helmet's cheek guard. He heard arrows thumping into the shields of his house cars. Gisli shouting, a horse squealing in pain as it thrashed on the ground. Then waves of warriors charged down the slopes, screaming war cries, and Magnus barely had time to draw his sword before they reached him. Two ran straight at him both carrying spears and round shields bearing the image of a double-headed eagle. The first warrior jabbed his spear upwards, and Magnus deflected the blade with his shield. Before he could recover, the second thrust at him, ramming his spear hard into the shield, knocking Magnus clean off his horse. He landed on the muddy track and rolled aside just before the first man's spear stabbed into the ground where his head had been. Magnus scrambled to his feet, still holding his sword and shield. The two warriors stood together now, facing him, one holding his spear high as if he were about to throw it, the other keeping his low for another thrust. The chaos of battle swirled around the three of them, blades rising and falling, shapes moving, men shouting. But for Magnus, the world had shrunk to the eyes of two men staring at him from beneath the rims of their helmets, and he knew he had to strike first, or die. So he leaped forward, screaming as loudly as he could, and crashed his shield into that of the warrior on the left, pushing him back. He swung his sword at the other man too, making him recoil. But they steadied themselves and advanced again, jabbing at Magnus with their spears, moving apart so he would leave himself open to one of them. As he had been taught, Magnus gave ground with his shield up, his heart pounding, his eyes flicking between the two men who wanted to kill him. Suddenly Hakon appeared at his right shoulder. With me, Magnus, he said, his voice calm, and the house carl stepped forward, hooking the blade of an axe over the shield rim of the nearest warrior in front of them, pulling it down to expose him. 
Magnus knew what he was expected to do and swung his sword, feeling the blade slice deep into flesh till it jarred against bone. Hakon hooked the other man's feet from under him with the axe and smashed it into his neck. The dark blood spurted and the warrior coughed and gurgled his life away. Are you all right, Magnus? said Hakon, turning to him. Any wounds? I'm fine, said Magnus. He stared at the bodies, their faces frozen in agony. His stomach churned and a foul taste filled his mouth. But he wouldn't let himself be sick, not when the battle was still going on. He looked round and saw that his house cars had dismounted and formed a shield wall, spears poking through like the spikes of a giant hedgehog. There were corpses heaped in front of them, but his house cars weren't fighting anyone. We were too strong for these northern wolves, said Hakon, seeing his puzzled expression. They were after easier prey, and your uncle has provided it. Magnus looked up to the track and saw what he meant. Tostig's men were surrounded by the ambushes. Some of them had managed to remain on their horses, but most were on foot, struggling to form a defensive wall. Magnus saw Gisli cut down and couldn't help feeling a surge of dark satisfaction at the sight. I suppose we ought to save them, said Magnus. Not that I want to. Then let's help slaughter them instead, said Hakon with a grin. Magnus sighed. You know I can't allow that, Hakon. Come on. But the ambushes broke off and melted away as soon as they saw the house cars approaching. Magnus felt he was being watched and raised his eyes to the end of the valley. On a ridge, two riders were outlined against the sky. They turned and slowly rode off, vanishing into the gathering gloom. Tostig was furious. He raged up and down the great hall, yelling at his commanders and Archbishop Eldred. You see how bold Edwin has become. He doesn't even bother to conceal his foul treachery anymore. The double-headed eagle is a symbol of Mercia. So they were his men, attacking my men in my earldom. Well, the swine has gone too far this time. Then he stormed out, followed by almost everyone, except for Magnus, Hakon and Archbishop Eldred. This cannot go on, Magnus, Eldred said quietly. Things are far worse now than when I wrote to your father. El Tostig is losing, but he refuses to admit it. Magnus remembered the letter his father had brooded over. He wondered how many other letters Eldred had written to his father and what they had said. Be careful how you speak of my lord's uncle, priest, said Hakon, practically spitting out the last word, hand on the hilt of his sword. El Tostig is a great warrior, and I doubt you've ever held a sword in your life. Magnus looked at Hakon startled by the venom in the housecarl's voice. It sounded as if he wanted to kill the archbishop, and after Hakon's comments about Tostig at the gatehouse, Magnus was surprised to hear him speak well of his uncle. That's as may be, the archbishop said calmly. I know when a man is following the wrong path, though. Speak to your father, Magnus. He must deal with this, and he must do it soon. Time is running out in the north for Earl Tostig Godwinson. The next day, Magnus left York with his men, heading south.